Hello, for today's video lecture, we're going to be talking about dry friction. So friction uh, is the force that prevents objects from sliding relative to one another. Uh, so sometimes this force is useful, such as the brakes on your car. You want those to have uh, enough friction force to stop you. Sometimes this is not useful, such as the drag force that slows down a plane down uh, that we're kind of opposing as we fly through the air. Um, so generally, friction is going to be broken down into two types of, of friction. Uh, we're going to have dry friction, also sometimes called Coulomb friction, uh, and that's the friction between two solid objects that are sliding relative to one another. So if I have one solid object on a surface and I kind of push it along the surface, that's going to be dry friction. Uh, the other type of friction is fluid friction. Uh, fluid friction is the uh, friction exerted by fluids on solid objects that are passing through them, uh, or by fluids flowing through other fluids. So if there is a fluid involved, it's a type of fluid friction. Here we're going to focus on dry friction uh, in the mechanics courses. Uh, fluid friction is more the domain of a fluid mechanics course. All right, so dry friction and the nature of the dry friction force. So imagine we have a book sitting on a table. Uh, so the book is blue, the table itself is purple. Uh, we've drawn a free body diagram here uh, with the different pieces. So I've got the gravity force pushing down, the normal force pushing back up from the table. Uh, I'm going to push on this uh, book in one direction, and I would have some friction force opposing that sliding. So in a perfectly rough surface, the pushing force and the friction force are going to be equal and opposite like this. So here, uh, simply the harder I push, the, the stronger the friction force back uh, against me. So this is what we've been treating things like uh, so far. We've been assuming the friction force is large enough to prevent any motion. And so we have this uh, line with a slope of 1 where the uh, basically the friction force is equal to the pushing force, x equals y. All right, so in a real surface, though, what's going to happen is I'm going to, if I imagine increasing the pushing force, so I push harder and harder and harder uh, until at some point uh, I start moving the object. Uh, and so when that happens, I'm going to start accelerating, which means I have imbalanced forces. So I've moved up the line, and I get to some point, and it starts moving. The friction force is actually going to drop down uh, and then maintain, once it's moving, it's going to maintain a constant friction, friction force uh, as it slides along the surface. Uh, so this is the nature of the dry friction force. So let's talk about the different parts of this uh, whole process. So we have these two points, uh, which are mu static times Fn and mu kinetic times Fn. Let's talk about those variables as well. All right, so in this whole situation, we've got kind of three different pieces. Uh, we've got the initial section where there's no motion, where F push is simply equal to the friction force. Uh, and so in this case, the pushing force and the friction force are equal and opposite. They're going to prevent motion. It's more or less an equilibrium problem. Uh, this is going to be true right up until the point uh, where uh, I'm going to have the point of impending motion. Uh, and so at some point, the friction force reaches a point where it is equal to mu static times Fn. Uh, so Fn is the normal force between the book and the table. So it's going to be between whatever two objects are going to be sliding relative to one another. Uh, and mu static uh, is the static coefficient of friction. This is going to depend upon the nature of the surfaces at play. So my book on the table is going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, something that is really slippery, uh, like a hockey puck on some ice, is going to have a really sl uh, small static coefficient of friction. Something like rubber on asphalt uh, is purposely going to have a much larger coefficient of friction. It's much harder to slide those two things relative to one another. So the point of impending motion is the point at which it's about to slip. So it's not slipping yet, but it's about to. Uh, and that's just a single point in space. Beyond that, um, the friction drops, or it will often drop. Um, so uh, once we start moving it, the friction force kind of falls off. Um, and that as we are sliding, the friction force is going to be mu kinetic times Fn. So we still the, the larger the normal force, the larger the friction force. Uh, but this mu static and mu kinetic are sometimes or often different numbers. 
Um, so mu kinetic, if there is a difference, mu kinetic is always going to be smaller than mu static. Uh, and so we can kind of feel this uh, intuitively. If you have a really heavy box and you're pushing it, you got to push and push and push. And then suddenly once it starts moving, uh, it, it kind of, you kind of fall into it and you can move it more easily. And it's easier to keep it moving than it is to start it up in the first place. All right. And so we've got in the middle this point of impending motion where it's about to slip. Uh, on the left side, we have no relative motion. So the object is going to be uh, either if the one surface is stationary, the object's stationary. Uh, and then suddenly it's sliding on the other side of that. Uh, or this is all about relative motion as well. So we can have two things that are rotating together. Uh, so an example of this would be like the clutch in a manual transmission car, uh, where the clutch, um, we've got relative motion if the two sides are rotating independently, uh, but the clutch kind of couples those two things together so they rotate together. So both of them are moving, but there's no relative motion uh, in the clutch of a car uh, when the um, two sides are coupled. All right, so that is the overall nature of the drive friction force. Uh, let's talk about these variables. So the friction coefficients, again, depend upon the materials that are in contact with one another. So sometimes it's just the, the materials that, are, that we have available. Uh, sometimes we want to specifically choose materials that have the appropriate coefficients of friction. So if we want to um, reduce the friction, we might use something like um, there are uh, bearings that are going to have nice smooth surfaces. Uh, certain plastics have low coefficients of friction. Uh, we can use lubrication. So steel on steel is going to have uh, some coefficient of friction. If we use a little bit of oil in there, um, then it becomes a much lower coefficient of friction. Um, and we can make it much higher as well. Uh, so like I said, rubber on asphalt uh, is intentionally a, a fairly high coefficient of friction because we want cars to be able to start moving, to stop, to turn. Uh, and the higher that coefficient of friction, the better it is going to be for controlling a car on the road. All right, so the other part of this is the normal force. So the normal force between the two surfaces will impact the friction force. So note it is the normal force, not the weight. Uh, so the normal force is the force between the two bodies that are in contact. So it's the force right at that interface, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and so the larger the normal force, the more friction force we have. So does this mean that a, uh, a truck, a very heavy truck is able to uh, stop faster than something like a very light car? Uh, and the answer is not exactly. So the truck has a greater weight, it's going to have a greater normal force, um, and so it's going to have a greater friction force if we kind of slam on the brakes in a big truck, uh, we have more friction force. Uh, but it takes more friction force to stop the truck. So F equals MA, if we have more friction force but we have more mass, we end up having the same acceleration. So in some cases, we can get around this. So something like a race car uh, that's going to have a Formula One race car is going to have lots of aerodynamics. Uh, those aerodynamic, the, the spoilers and fins and everything are going to be pressing down on the car. So we actually end up getting a greater normal force than just the weight. Uh, and so if I increase the normal force without increasing the mass, then yes, I can do things like stop the car faster, corner uh, more quickly because not only do I have very sticky tires on there that are going to have a, uh, a high coefficient of friction, but I am artificially inflating this normal force so I can get the maximum possible friction force to accelerate, to turn, to brake, uh, and all those things are controlling the vehicle. All right, so as a review, uh, before an object reaches the point of impending motion, your friction force is whatever is necessary to keep the body from moving. Uh, so friction force is equal to pushing force uh, in a simple scenario like that. Uh, at the point of impending motion, that's when you have the equation, the friction force is equal to mu static 
times the normal force. So again, normal force, not gravity force, and mu static is going to de depend upon the materials on both sides of that interface. Uh, so that is where it is about to slip. Beyond that point of impending motion, now we have the bodies uh, moving relative to one another, or they're just kind of sliding against one another. And so once that happens, the friction force is mu k, or the kinetic coefficient of friction, times the normal force. So normal st force is still involved, uh, and sometimes mu k and mu static are different numbers. Uh, when they are different numbers, uh, the mu kinetic is, almost, is always going to be a lower number than mu static. It always takes m at least as much force, if not more force, to get something started than it does to keep it going. All right, so again, I can't emphasize enough, make sure you're using the normal force, not the weight force in an object when you're calculating these friction forces. All right, that's all we have for today's video lecture. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again.